All right, let us see what we are having in this case. All right, this is our Electrotechnics N4 from our 28 March exam. Uh, that is 2024. So we're gonna consider how you're supposed to attempt our typical question, working. Um, okay, just make sure you go through your instructions so that you'll be able to understand how to answer your questions. So there we're gonna quickly rush through our questions. The first part of our question is on the principles of electricity. 1.1, you are given to choose the correct term from those in brackets and write it next uh, and write it next to the question number that you're given. All right. The first part we have got 1.11 to gain the insight, to gain insight into the nature of electric currents, it is necessary to consider all right, the structure or the circle of the atom. So they were supposed to consider the structure of the atom. Then on 1.12, at the center of the atom is the nucleus of the electrons, guys. The nucleus is the one that we have at the center, and it consists of what? The protons and neutrons. So there we've got uh, the nucleus. Then the resistance of, um, of material is inversely or directly proportional to its cross-sectional area. The resistance is equal to the rho L over area like this, where we've got um, the resistivity times the length over the area. This area considered or compared to the resistance, that it is inversely, this is inverse proportional. As the area is increasing, the resistance decreases. As the area decreases, the resistance increases. But considering the resistance and the length, they are directly proportional, these two. So you can also consider from your formula. So this is inversely proportional to the cross-sectional area or to its cross-sectional area. Then we are given on 1.14, the residual flux density, we are given the residual flux density of hysteresis can be reduced to zero by applying a negative or positive magnetic flux density. You're supposed to apply a negative uh, magnetic uh, field strength. On 1.15, you are now given in hysteresis the residual flux density. So this is just a repetition here. Like they're just opposed the way that like you start in here, going this was guess this side. In hysteresis, the residual flux, which is the same residual flux density, can be increased or reduced to zero by applying tech note, by applying what? A negative magnetic field strength. As we can see, we are, we are still working with our negative whenever you apply a negative this must be reduced it must be reduced to zero just like what we have to be reduced to zero what is being applied negative so it's just like uh one question asked in a different way guys are we seeing this is the one statement that you have there it's one statement that we are having here okay uh on 1.16 the Two principal laws of electromagnetism are always known as, all right, which laws do we consider? These are the Faraday's laws, the one for electromagnetism. And on 1.17, the cause produced uh, produces the magnetism, uh, magnetization of the circuit. And this property of the cause is called, all right, the cause produces the magnetization of the circuit. And the, this property of the coils is called, all right, that is the magnetomotive force. So this one is the magnetomotive force. Since the resultant or reluctance of the magnetic circuit is low, considering a magnetic circuit, guys, we're talking of what? The reluctance there, okay? Uh, the self-inductance, this and that is compared to this, okay? Then on 1.19, a capacitor or resistor comprises of plates and an insulating material. That's a capacitor resistor, does not have that. All right, the capacitance of a capacitor is inversely proportional or directly proportional to its area. Uh, remember, from our principles of like when we are working with the capacitance, we can calculate the capacitance from uh, the comparison where you are giving area and also the number of plates. 
So when it's considered with the area, it is uh, proportional to the area that you are given, but to the diameter, that the distance that you're given, I mean, the distance between them is going to be what inversely proportional. So in this case, we're given the capacitance is what proportional to, all right, to the area of the plates and inversely proportional to the what, to the distance. So like I was saying, the distance, it is inversely proportional, but to the area, it is what directly proportional. So in terms of area, it is directly proportional to the area. We can also consider this from the formula of our capacitance, calculating capacitance, just like what we saw on that part that had that was considering uh, resistance. You can consider the part of uh, resistance, like what I mean, like what we had on that formula of resistance. Like uh, we saw that we can just consider direct. All right, this is eight marks. All right, so on this question one point two, I actually wonder, like, why why these eight marks? Because okay, I want you to see what is happening here. A resistor of 160 ohms is connected in parallel with the resistor of one of 15 ohms. This is it. We have got two resistors here, a resistor of uh, 160 ohms and a resistor of uh, 15 ohms. These two resistors are connected in parallel. And the com this combination is then connected in series with an unknown resistance. There is an unknown resistance that we have. All right. The circuit, which is the wall of this circuit, is connected, guys. The wall of this circuit that we are seeing, it is later connected to a what? A voltage of 75 volts, which is the, the supply. So there's a 75 volt supply. These two resistors, we are given. One of these resistors is 160 ohms. Another resistor that we are given is uh, 15 ohms that is in what? In parallel. And the other one is the unknown. We do not know this. But the question is, Calculate the total resistance, which is the total resistance of this circuit, guys. If given that, and, and also the total power. So you need the total resistance and also the total power. If the total current is 2,5 amps, if the current that is flowing, and this is the total current of 2,5 amps, guys, why it marks? Because there is no need even for us to calculate anything about this unknown resistance or what? Guys, what is it that we know given total current and total voltage? It's enough for us to have the total resistance. So this was uh, a question which was not uh, like, they did not figure out when they were setting this question. They just saw like, oh, okay, let us just give the marks. No, you're not even, you're not asked to calculate this unknown resistance. Why are you calculating it? We have got the current and the voltage. This is enough to give us the total. When this is combined together here, we know when this is combined to a single resistor, that is the total resistance. And that total resistance can be calculated from the total voltage over the total current because we have got this. The total voltage is there. The total current is there. We are given. So why bother in calculating the unknown resistance? This and uh, it's not. It's not. It's not. It's not like that. So this is going to give us 30 ohms. So it was a question which was set out of, uh, like they did not find time to, to work on it. Like, okay, this is eight marks. Unless if you're not given anything about, and there is something that you too, that you have to work from that unknown resistor. But, but, but not like this. Why bother in calculate this? No, why bother in all that? And also even the total power, there's no even need for you to calculate this unknown resistor. You have the total voltage, and I mean the total voltage and the total current. So this is simply total voltage times the total current. We have got the total power. So meaning to say our total power is simply the voltage that we're given times the total current of 2,5 amps. And that was going to give us 187,5 watts, which is the power. Just like that. So I don't know. Eight marks there, guys. Like. All right, so that is sometimes they can have a condition like that where you have to figure out, okay, there is no need for me to even calculate this because there are formulas that are can be used as long as you're applying the, right, the, the direct formulas. All right, 1.3, fig one below shows a Winston Bridge circuit diagram. Use Kirchhoff's laws, supposed to work with the Kirchhoff's laws, and calculate the currents flowing 
through each branch of the circuit. So this is our circuit. I want us to see. So we are going to consider uh, coding to Remember, this is your choice. We're just given presentations here, uh, positive, negative, the flow of currents, and so on. So we are going to choose. It's your own. Uh, we are not given even the loop to work with. All right. So in this case, uh, unfortunately, like previously, we used to get rid of, of the, the voltages. But in this case, there's no way each and every loop that we have, there's a voltage. This loop, there's a voltage. Yeah, there's a voltage. Any loop that you want to take, there's a voltage that is there. So we just have to consider any part. So I'm going to take A to B to D and back to this A, A, B like that. All right. So let me consider this loop. All right. So the first loop that I'm going to consider, I'm going to consider loop A, B, D, A, like I said, A, B, D, A. So I want us to take this loop here. Remember, we are supposed to work with the voltage to the sum of what? The sum of the voltage drop that you are given must be equal to the sum of the currents that you are going to have multiplied to the what? To the resistance, which is the voltage drop of, about on each part. So let's consider this loop. Already we are given a certain direction on our diagram. So if I'm to consider the direction that is already given this way, we are going to see that in terms of the voltage, it is not the way that it's supposed to be because this is a positive this side, this is a negative this side. If we are taking this direction, it means the current is flowing this way. So if the current was flowing this way and this voltage is supposed to be taken as a positive, but look, we have the positive this side, meaning to say originally from our circuit, the current is supposed to flow this way or from this source that we are given of what? Of uh, three volts. So whenever it opposes, because we are supposed to have something like this, guys, we are supposed to have a connection because we are taking our loop this way. So this is the way that we are supposed to have a positive in that direction. This R is supposed to flow the same way of the positive, but it is not the same way. So whenever it is like that, we are going to take our E as a negative. So that is going to be negative. The voltage which is three is equal to, so we're going to have the voltage drops along, all right, which is current times resistance. So let's consider from point A to point B, what is happening from point A going to point B. We're now considering how the current is flowing, this current here. It is flowing the same way that we are taking our loop, look the same way, this current from A to B. We are following, the same way that we are taking, the way that you take your loop and the way of current is supposed to be the same so that it's positive. Whenever it opposes, it's a negative. Just like the voltage, it was opposing. So that's why we put a negative. But this current is not opposing. It is moving the same way. So it's going to be taken as positive. So that is resistance uh, times current. That is one times one. So this is going to be equal to one times one, that is simply one, okay? So that's one I1. Let's move on. Uh, now you're gonna move on from the point B to the point C, to the point D. So that is B going to D. So as you can see, B to D, we are following the same way of our loop. And current, look at this current, is it is following the same way. So it's gonna be a positive. It will remain as a positive, but there is a resistance, consider, so that is two times, I3. So that's 2 times I3. It's a positive again. 2 times I3. All right, let's see. From D back to A, if you consider from D back to the point A, what is happening here? We are supposed to move this way. But look how the current is taken. The current is flowing in another direction. It is opposing the way of our loop. So it's going to be taken as a negative. So that's minus 1 times i2 so it's going to be a negative it is opposing so that's minus i2 so as you can see this equation is in simplest form we can just write in our simplest form that is i1 plus uh 2 i3 minus i2 is equal to what is equal to minus 3 so we've got our first equation from that loop so we are going to consider another loop again so let's consider another loop from this part all right so in this case 
I want us to consider this loop here. We have taken this one. I want us to consider this other one here where there's a voltage also. Uh, that is the loop of uh, from here C to D to B to C like this. C, are, are you seeing the way the arrow is taken here? You want to consider the way the arrow that is there. So you're going to take the loop C to D to B back to C. All right. So let's consider from C to D. We're supposed to have this way. This is the way that we are moving C to D. Is it the same way our voltage is? That is exactly the voltage, the positive is this side, meaning to say we are moving exactly in the same way of our loop, guys, C to D. Take note what was happening, guys. From A to B, we are moving this way. The positive is supposed to be on that other side. Look also, the arrow there should also help you according. This diagram, they tried even to indicate the arrows for you guys. So you can even to say according to the arrow, it is following the same way that we are supposed to move. So this voltage will be taken as a positive. So that's four is equal to. Let's consider now the current. According to the movement, we are moving this way. Look, the movement. But the current is opposing. The current is the one that is opposing. So the current will be taken as a negative because it is opposing from C to D. We are opposing the movement. So that means we are going to have minus three times the current. Uh, that is I2 plus I3. All right. So we have taken C to D. Let's move on from D to B. From D to B, as we are moving up, we can see that we are opposing this current because the current is going down. So that will be a minus two times I3. We are going uh, the other way. The current is going another way. There is no voltage to be considered. Then from B to C, this is our movement from B to C, B to C. We are moving this way and we are maintaining the arrow. The, it's going the same way, B to C. So this will be a positive. So that's two times the current, which is our current. That's I1 minus i3 so this is i3 all right so that's i1 minus i3 just like that you formed an equation so just simplify that's four is equal to minus three i2 times this that will be minus three i3 minus two i3 plus two expand here so that's going to be two i1 two times this that will be minus two i3 all right so four is equal to going to collect like terms uh, there is current one here, so that will be two I one. Then current two, there is minus three, minus. All right, we need current two, so it's just minus three there. All right, so we've got minus three I two. Then current three, there is minus three here, minus two here, minus two here, so that will be a minus seven. So that's minus seven I three which is equal to 4. So meaning so you can just write as 2i1 minus 3i2 minus 7i3 is equal to what? Is equal to 4. All right, so there we have got uh, second equation. So I just want to use this other part, guys, to create um, the other equation. So I'm just going to write my other, uh, my other equation here so that I can use this space. Sorry for that. So our second one, we got 2i1 minus 3i2. All right, guys. Okay, no problem. Let me just also, I'm going to rewrite this in the in the same format. Remember this one, it was uh, i1. Let's just have minus i2 plus 2i3, like having the order of what? i2, i3. So that's minus i2 plus 2i3. All right. So that is our first equation, and this is our second equation. So since we have got uh, three unknown values, current one, current two, current three, that means we need three equations. These are simultaneous equations. The number of unknown, that is the number of equations that you're supposed to have. Two unknown, two equations. Three unknown, three equations. So we are supposed to obtain three equations so let's formulate the third one uh it's gonna depend with you which loop are you going to take but as for me i considered this loop here a d c this one like 
moving from A to D, C like this, back to, back to the point A. All right, so let's see what's happening in this loop. It's just easier to consider loop A, D, C, uh, back to the point A. All right, in this loop, we can see that there are two voltages to be considered in this loop here. This is the loop that we are taking here. There are two voltages to be considered. There is a voltage across the loop, which is DC, along DC. There is a voltage across this C, back to, back to A. All right, so when you have got two voltages, just consider the way we are supposed to take them. We are supposed to move this way. So meaning to say, E3 is moving in the right direction. Look the arrow and our loop. We are moving the same way. So E3 is moving in the same direction, which is the 10 volts. So it's going to be a positive. But if we check what is happening with this part of our E2, we are supposed to be moving this way, guys. This is the way that we are, according to the loop, this is, this is the way. We are supposed to be moving this way. But if you check here at E2, E2 is moving this way. It's taken this way. Okay, check consider the, the signs also of the, the battery there. It's taken the other way. So meaning to say E2 is going to be a negative. Okay, you subtract that. It is equal to the voltage drops. Let us consider our voltage drops. Uh, you can even consider uh, from point D to point C. What is happening from point D to point C? So you must be careful with the circuit that you're given. I would consider the voltages. All right. So we can even consider our movement. We can just move from D to C, or you can even, the way that you want, guys, all right? Or you can even start from A to D. The movement is now yours in terms of the current, all right? You can even consider the same way that you're having there so that you don't have confusion. So from A to D, we are moving the same way. Look, the current It's moving the same way. So that's a positive. So this is going to be, a positive though. so that's current times resistance so that is going to be one times current two uh resistance and current then we move on from d to c d to c this is the way how, how is the current flowing it is flowing the same way look the arrow of the current is going the same way so it's a positive so that's a positive there so we are going to have a positive uh Three times the current, that is three times I2 plus I3. Let's move on from C to D, from C uh, mean to A, do it doing this way, C, back to the point A there. The current is there, which is I1 plus I2. And it is moving the same way. Look, current is moving the same way. So that's a positive. So we've got current and resistance. So that's one times the current which is a positive, like I says, it's going to be plus them. So that's it. We have formed an equation. This is the same current that we are even seeing here, I1 plus I2. So we can simplify this further. Uh, that is going to be 6 is equal to, uh, we have got I2 plus 3 times I2, that is 3. I2 plus 3 times I1, uh, 3 times I3, sorry, that is 3 I3. 1 times I1, that is going to be I1 plus I2. So that is 6 is equal to, let us take the uh, current one, just have this I1 here. So that is, we're going to have I1. All right, then consider I2. There's I2 here. There's I2 here. There's also I2 here. So that is 1 plus 3 plus 1 also. So that is going to be 5. All right, so this is going to give us uh, 5 I2. Then in terms of I3, we just have this I3 only. So that is 3 I3. So that's it, guys. So we've got our equation 3. I1 plus 5 I2 plus 3 I3 is equal to 6. That will be our equation 3. So it's up to you how you consider the loop. You could have even considered uh, along this bridge, along the wall of this circuit like this. It's up to you. Guys, it's up to you. So as long as you have got uh, the loops that you're going to take and you formulate three equations, that will be enough. So we've got I1 plus 5I2 plus 3I3, which is equal to 6. So that is our third equation. All right. In the previous questions that we had working with the Kichops, 
law and the solving part when we are given three unknown values like that guys i want you to consider where we are given three unknown values so remember this is equal to uh minus three all right that was our first equation there were so many ways that we're using to solve the given simultaneous equations using the subchain you eliminate you do this and that there's so many ways but in this case i also want to consider back to our mathematics we have got this part or where we apply our Kremers rule remember that in our mathematics it is the same thing we can because as long as you're solving simultaneous equation this is part of our syllabus also remember it's part of our syllabus determinants working with those determinants concept how are you going to calculate this currents i1 was going to be the determinant according to i1 over the determinant of constants i2 determinant of i2 over the determinant of constants i3 determinant of i3 over the determinant of constants so i just want you to consider also that's another method but if you uh use because i explained this uh part before so i want you to consider the other way that i explained before but for the sake of revision, let's have different ways. So that is uh, the determinant according to I1 from our mathematics, guys. We know that where there is I1, we are going to substitute with the constants also that you are given. So that is minus 3, 4, 6. Then in this case, we're going to consider uh, that's negative 1, negative 3, neg uh, 5. So do not use this method if you do not understand it from your mathematics and 4 unless if you understand it if you do understand other way then please just use another way uh the other ways that i explained before uh yeah just want us to consider different ways for others also so the same for i2 remember you must substitute where there is i2 you're gonna substitute the constants My, uh, okay the first part as it is sorry the first part just take it as it is that is one two one so that's one two one by the part of I2, you substitute with the constants. So that is going to be minus 3, 4, 6. All right. The part of I3, just take as it is 2, minus 7, 3. All right. That's it. We move on to the determinant that is going to correspond to I3. Meaning, meaning to say, in place of this I3, you're going to substitute with the constants. So the first part is going to remain as it is 1, 2, 1 minus one minus three five then in place of i3 remember you substitute your constants minus three four six so this is it then the last part will be just the determinants that are of the constants just considering the constants where this time there is nothing that we are going to substitute here we're just going to take everything as it is that's a one two one one two one minus one minus three five and this will be 2 minus 7, uh, 3. All right. So this will be the determinant that you need. The determinant of this. The determinant. So remember, guys, your determinant concept, like I said, uh, use this method because you already understand how to calculate your determinants from your mathematics. And for remember, use plus or minus, plus, and so on. Minus, plus, uh, minus, plus, minus, plus, and so on. All right. So in this case, I'm just going to consider the first row, plus, minus, plus. So what does it mean? That means it's going to be 1 with a plus. So that's 1. We close the row and column where this 1 is. What is remaining? We are remaining with this part, which is a 2 by 2 matrix. Minus 3, minus 7, 5, 3. The minus 1 and the minus. So remember, minus, minus, that's a plus. The determinant of, you close this. And the corresponding row so you're going to remain with the 2 minus 7 uh 2 minus 7 1 3 all right the last term is 2 with a plus so that's plus 2 we take this part close the column row like this so what is remaining you write it as a matrix 2 uh minus 3 uh that is 1 5 okay so that's it guys you're going to determine the determinant of this just like your normal part determinant remember the product of the major diagonal so i'm just going to explain on this one and the rest guys i'm just going to okay write the answers product of this 
minus the product of that. So in this case, it was going to be one times, uh, that will be the product minus three, minus minus is going to be a plus. So that will be 26 at the end. Okay, that will be 26 plus one into three, uh, two times three, which is six, minus minus is going to be six minus minus seven. That is a 13 plus two, that is 10 here, minus minus three, which is a 13. So combine this, you're going to obtain 65. So that's your determinant concept, guys, all right? So I want you to go through your determinant concept from your mathematics. Like I said, you can use other ways. So you're going to do that, obtain the determinant here, you calculate it. So it's going to be like a lot of stages to consider. But if you're comfortable with determinants, guys, that's another way. So you calculate the determinant here, you're going to obtain 52. You do the same thing on I2. You find your determinant just like the previous uh, case. You're going to obtain 109. Uh, the determinant, according to this, also you are going to calculate this, and that was going to be negative 69. So that is using these determinants now. We can simply substitute. So these determinants, guys, you calculate the same way that you did here using the plus minus concept. Like I said, uh, it's up to you the same way that you're going to use. So I1 was going to be. The determinant according to I1, which is 52, over that of constants, which is 65. So you have to divide, that is obtaining current 1. 52 over 65, that was going to be 0, 0,8 amps. Same on uh, current 2, that was going to be that determinant of current 2 over that of constants. So I2, that is 109 over that of the constants, which is 65. So this was going to give us uh, 1,677 amps. All right. So we consider this also on I3. So it was going to be that of I3, which is the determinant that we got corresponding to I3, which is negative 65 over that of the constants. So it's negative 69, sorry, over that of the constants. And our constants, it's uh, 65. So that was going to be negative 1, 6, uh, negative 1, uh, 0, 0, 6, 2, like that, amps. So that is it, guys. You're going to consider your determinants also. What I'm trying to say is that the methods thereafter of solving, since you're in N4, and you also have mathematics where you deal with determinants, you can consider that part of determinants. But the solving part, uh, just consider also uh, the other videos that we considered, guys, working with uh, the Kirchhoff's law. Uh, I talked about different ways where you have to uh, work with two equations, eliminate one and substitute until you remain with maybe two currents of the same so that you can use your normal methods then using substitute until, until you get, you work with your substitution until the end. So that was our question. 12 marks, as we can see, that was worth it for, for these calculations and 30 marks on uh, everything on question one. Uh, on question one. So I want you to consider as an individual, redo that question. But if you still have challenges on just solving that part, let me know on the comment section so that we can have a video on just on that part only so that it, at least it can help on, on solving those uh, simultaneous equations using substitution method. All right, on question two, DC machines. What type of winding would be used for each of the following 2.11, a high voltage, low current DC machine? So they would prefer a wave winding. And on a high current, low voltage, you prefer a lap winding. Then on the other part, we are given uh, that is 2.2. What are the two methods of connecting field coils of a DC of DC machines? So remember, when working with DC machines, we can have uh, a self-excited. You can work with a self-excited, or you can work with a separately excited DC machine. So that is uh, the connection, the methods of connecting that can be used. All right. Then 2.3, we are given a long shunt, a long shunt compound 
wound motor a long shunt compound wound motor all right so let's just focus on the statement a long shunt besides whatever that you're given later on like this and that let's just consider that alone 2.3 this is what you're given this is a long shunt so that's 2.3 so we are dealing with a long shunt uh compound wound uh dc motor so remember that's a motor that we are talking about and we do understand that motor it draws in current must draw draws in current different from a generator so a motor draws in the current so we are going to have uh remember we're gonna have our shunt uh this is a long shunt so this is the shunt field then for a long shunt uh, we are going to consider the series field the series winding connected to the armature so we are going to have the series connected to the armature that is the major part and knowing that it draws current this is a motor so we're going to have our load current the voltage and so on all right then uh on this other part all right so we're going to have p in and p out uh the series field uh that is the series to this armature and we're going to have our shunt and so on uh the shunt field current and also we are going to consider flowing this side the armature current uh and the series field which are actually the same armature and the series field remember they are in series so that's a basic diagram that you just need is just just a second diagram just to just need a sketch of a long shunt compound wound motor so they are saying it draws 32 amps from where from the 300 volt which is from the source so this is the current drawn the, the from the load 32 amps so it draws in current that is 32 amps when this is 300 volt which is the terminal voltage from that we are given that the long shunt uh so the shunt series field and the armature resistance respectively are given all right so we've got the first one which is the shunt so the first one is for the shunt field 120 ohms is for the shunt field here there is 120 ohms all right following and so on the next one the series field 0 0.2 ohms that is for the series field we are given uh 0 0.2 ohms and the last one for the armature which is the armature resistance 0 0.16 ohms like that respectively 0 0.16 ohms so this is it so from this whole combination that we are given the question is calculate the magnitude of the back emf in used in the armature seven marks for that the magnitude of the back emf so remember the back emf is simply the voltage minus the armature current times the resistance of the armature from our equivalent from it the resistance of the armature what is it that we are of the armature circuit from the armature circuit what is it that is there there are two resistances in series that of the armature and they said there is one current flowing so it's considered as a single component because what the same current is flowing here so you take that as a single component so therefore e is equal to v minus the armature current times the sum because they are in series so you take that as a single component, the series and the armature resistance together. So this is the resistance of the armature circuit, what is considered there as part of the armature. There is also a series. So you add these two. So the question is, are we having everything on this formula? The voltage is there. Armature current is not there. Series and also these are there. So we need to calculate first armature current from where there is a relationship between this current from our kitchen of slows as i explained before the current flowing towards the junction is equal to the current flowing away so the load current is flowing towards this junction whereas this shunt field and also the armature or the series field because these two are the same they are flowing away so from there we can calculate uh we can transpose this shunt that is the load current minus the shunt current is equal to the armature current. So that's it. So meaning to say the armature current is equal to the load minus the shunt. 
But as you can see, we, we, we are formulating to calculate the armature current in the formulation, we can see that we do not have another current again, which is the shunt, the current, uh, uh, this shunt. So lucky enough, the voltage is the same as the voltage are across this shunt. This voltage there is the same. So we can take advantage of having a voltage and a resistance that current can be calculated. So that's V over R shunt. So meaning to say, we're going to use the voltage that we are given of 300 over the resistance of the shunt, 120 ohms. So that was going to give us uh, the shunt current, which is 2,5 amps. So with this shunt current that we have just calculated, we can obtain the armature current from the load current of 32 amps minus the shunt current that we just calculated of 2,5. The armature current was going to give us uh, 29,5 amps. And with this, we can now calculate what we refer to as the back EMF. What was missing was the armature current. Now we have it. So the voltage of 300 minus uh, the armature current that we just calculated 29,5 into the sum of this resistance building up the armature circuit, which is the 0, 0,2 of the series and the 0, 0,16 of the armature uh, part of the armature resistance on its own. So that was going to give us uh, the back EMF. Remember, you're dealing with the motor. I'm going to consider this as the back EMF. All right, so this was going to give us 289,38 volts as the back EMF. All right, so that's our circuit, guys. And these are the formulas that you just need uh, to consider properly. Consider what you are given. What are you working with on your circuit? All right. So that was our question. Uh, two point four. Uh, two point three. All right. Then two point four. We're now given a dedicated learner from a Jivativet college he has received an apprenticeship from a well-known uh company in Newcastle. That is what we are given. Given an apprenticeship. Uh, that is silicon technology. As part of her training, she was required to do wiring and fault finding on DC machines. That's an interview there. 2.41, show by means of a neat, fully labeled circuit diagram, a shunt first plate starter used to start a DC, to start a DC machines. That is working with a shunt first plate starter. All right. So they go, I got a diagram which we can consider on our shunt. Uh, let me just try and uh, share this part so that we can consider also clear diagrams. So I think with this diagram, uh, it is clear enough that we can consider our circuit breaker, uh, everything from our trip contacts that we're given, the armature, uh, everything. So I think, guys, we can have. This diagram is clear. Just consider uh, to go through also your diagrams, uh, each and every starter that you have in your syllabus, all right? So 2.42, what is the chief purpose of a DC motor starter? The chief purpose is like uh, the major purpose that you are given. So the major purpose is to reduce high starting current, to reduce high starting current currents to an acceptable one to an acceptable uh to an acceptable one all right so we are reducing the starting current to an acceptable one which is to an acceptable value required uh on that dc motor that you'll be given on question number three this was ac theory an ac theory that is the major part question 3.1 we are given a 410. So this type of a question, actually everything, like if you consider this, we are given the number of tens, like a 410. Let's just take our information or our data there. We are given, and remember the number of tens. So I'm just going to consider this as N. So we are given 400 tens with dimensions 35 centimeters by 20 centimeters. So this is in a rectangular form, which 
is giving us uh, in meters just divided by 100, that will be 0 0.35 by 0 0.2. So it's just like the area of this rectangular section. And we are also given the speed of uh, 625 revs per minute. So we're given that is rotated about an axis through the center and parallel to the coil sides. To the coil sides, the field is a uniform magnetic flux density. So there we are given a uniform magnetic flux density of 0 0.5 Tesla. Calculate the following on 3.11, the maximum value of the generate of the EMF generated. So I want you to consider this, guys, from your formula sheet. If you've forgotten this, uh, also consider your formula sheet. All right. So just going to want you to consider on your alternating current on this part, uh, formula number 33. Just see this thing of sharing the screen now. It's another part, but I just hope you're going to be able to see uh, this, this formula, which is our E max, the maximum. That is 2 times pi times B times A times N. So I'm just going to explain uh, the formula that we are given there, uh, what it is representing. But if you're forgotten, you can consider your formula. So that is the for the maximum value of the EMF generated, which is uh from our formula all right so let's just consider this is our data here let's just consider this so that's 3.11 so the maximum which is our e is given as 2 pi times b which is our flux density times the area times the number of turns times n which is the speed so you must know your formula guys this is our flux density there considering the flux density, uh, this is our area in square meters. Uh, we're talking of the number of tens, the number of tens, and this is our speed that is supposed to be revs per second. So the N represents revs per second. So if you check, guys, everything is given. So it's going to be 2 pi times our magnetic flux density, 0 0.75. The area, it's a rectangular cross-section. This by this, that is length times width. So it's 0 0.35 times 0 0.2. That is, we are having our area in this case. The number of turns, how many turns are we given? That is 400. The speed in revs per second, this is revs per minute. So how do you convert revs per minute to revs per second? We divide by a 60. So like this, we are going to obtain uh, the maximum value of the EMF generated. And that was going to be 1,000. 374,447 volts. All right. So if you're using this, you're obtaining uh, exact values uh, that, you, you, uh, that you are obtaining. So you must be careful with what you are, with what you are given from that, uh, from that condition. Uh, all right. So I want us to see another part Another part, another part. Uh, let us see another part also. Very sorry for that. So that is uh, three marks. It was just three marks for that. Then here the RMS value, 3.12, the RMS and average values of the EMF two marks. So the RMS and the average value. So since we have got the maximum value also from our formula sheet, guys, we've got the formulas for maximum. And uh, I mean, for the RMS value, uh, that is going to consider 0, 0.07 times the maximum. Uh, if you consider the average value, that will be 0, 0.637, 0, 0.637 times the maximum value that you are given. So that you, because you have the maximum value, guys, already from your calculations here, what were you calculating? The maximum value. So meaning to say we have it. So to calculate the RMS value, it is just a continuation. So 3.12, the RMS value uh, is going to be 0, 0.707 times the maximum value, which is 0, 0.707 times our maximum value, 1,374,447. So that is the product of these two, which was going to be 971,734 volts. So with the same part, 
you can also calculate the average value, which was 0, 0,6. Uh, 37 times the maximum value, which is 0, 0,6. 37, our maximum value, remember, that is 1374,447. So with this, guys, you are going to obtain the average value, which is 875,523 volts, something like that. So that's it. Uh, we can calculate these values according to what you. Uh, given that it was something direct, guys. All right. With reference to AC, brief, explain briefly what you understand by the crest factor. So remember the crest factor, we are simply talking about uh, the ratio that is between uh, the maximum value of a voltage or a current or of a sine wave to the RMS value. So we are talking about uh, the maximum value to the RMS value, the ratio that you are given. In an AC circuit. All right. Then another part that we are given it was 3.3. .3. A parallel circuit, we are given this is a parallel circuit. It has two branches that draw uh, the following currents. So let's say we are given in this case, uh, uh, let's say there's an impedance that you have and another impedance that you have. Guys, there's a current that will flow here, yeah, a current, but that's a parallel. We do know that the currents are not the same in a parallel. So there we are given the first current, which is I1. So in terms of the maximum value and also the angle that is affecting I2 maximum value, also the angle. And if you check, this is our omega. Remember, this is supposed to be uh, omega T. So the first question was to calculate 3.31, the time period of the current. So the time period of the current we can calculate it, guys, from our omega in this case here. Remember time, 3.13, time is equal to 1 over frequency. Time is 1 over frequency. And frequency can be calculated. Where can we calculate frequency from? From this omega, because we do understand that omega is 2 pi f. So frequency divided by 2 pi, both sides divided by 2 pi. So it's going to be omega over 2 pi, which is the omega, this value affecting t. That is 314,2 over 2 pi. So you have got the frequency in this case. So we're going to obtain 50,00 or something like that, which is approximately uh, 50 hertz. So with the frequency, we can calculate our time. Remember time, it's one over frequency. And all these formulas, we have them, guys, we're given from your formula sheet. So you must also consider the formulas, you're given time, it's one over frequency, but frequency from where? You have to consider now from this omega. So in this case, our time, okay, why am I repeating here? One over 50, which is our frequency. So that was going to give us 0, uh, 0.02 seconds, or you can even write in milliseconds, which is 20 milliseconds. That is, if you want to write in milliseconds, or you can just leave your answer at this stage. All right, so that was the... First part of our question to have the time. So you work with the omega that you are given related to the frequency. You can work with that. Then on 3.3 to calculate the maximum value of the current drawn from the supply. Remember, these two currents are from the supply. So we've got I1 and we also have I2. So from the I supply, that is the total current. So the question is simply calculate the total current. So remember, it's going to be I1 plus I2. That is our currents in this case. But we can write I1 in simpler form. That is I1 is equal to 8,85. Uh, that is 8,85. So you're going to take the angle minus pi over 3. So remember pi, that is 180. So pi over 3, it means 180 over 3. So it's going to be minus uh, 60 degrees. All right. Then we do the same thing on uh, I3, on I2, sorry. Our I2 is going to be maximum value. So you write the maximum value out, 4,77, the angle, pi over 4. So that's 180 degrees divided by 4, which is going to be 45 degrees. So I asked you to express this, your answer in the trigonometric form. In That is in this format, the same way that we are seeing here. This same way is difficult for us to do calculations under this way. So we write these in a rectangular 
uh, in our polar form so that we can convert them to rectangular form, perform our calculations. Remember, uh, it is easier for us to perform addition in our rectangular form. All right, so that will be 3.32. So you're going to add these two currents that we are given. All right, so 3.32. So the total current is going to be given as I1 plus I2. So meaning to say we are simply referring to I1, which is 8,85 angle of minus 60 degrees plus I2, which is 4,77. Uh, 4,77 angle of 45 degrees. Remember, this is a, a polar form, which is written back in our normal Cartesian from our R theta in polar form. We do understand this represents R cos theta plus R j sine of theta. So meaning to say, as we do understand that our addition is best that we do write that in a, in a rectangular form. So we can convert this to a rectangular form using that format. Or you can just use our calculator direct, guys, all right? Uh, in this case, we're going to have 8,85 the cos of negative 60 degrees plus 8,85j, the sine of negative 60 degrees. Or just use your calculator direct, guys, only that. Yeah, I want us also to consider this other part. Uh, plus 4,7, 7, seven uh, the cost, so we're going to have the cost of 45 degrees plus 4,77. 7. Then we're going to have uh, the sine of what? Of 45 degrees. So this is it. So instead of us having this, like we could have just worked in a normal rectangular from our calculator, we can have the conversion, remember, direct to rectangular form. So in this case, this is a real term. This is a real term. You combine that. All right. So how are you going to? Okay. Let me let me also explain this part of uh, our conversion, guys. Uh, just like this part, four comma seven seven to polar to rectangular form. So it's shift press this um, rectangular form minus. So you're gonna press four comma seven seven like this. So you separate this with a comma on shift. So it's shift this comma here, and that will be 45 degrees like this, like this. So it is going to give you, in rectangular form, remember, we need x plus jy, so it's going to give us the value of x. So this is x plus jy like this, okay? So it gives us answers in rectangular form. So you can actually not write this stage that I'm, I'm, I'm having here. You cannot actually, uh, I mean, have this stage that I'm having here. You can just avoid that. But if you are having this or you've decided to have it this way, then you have to combine, like I said, the real terms together. These are the real terms where we do not have a J. We do not have a J. So that uh, these are the real terms. So we are going to obtain 7,798. Then the imaginary part. So we're going to take this part, sine minus 60. All right. That is your imaginary. There's a J there. You also... Consider this, there is imaginary here where we have got a sign. If each and every part of a sign is supposed to be imaginary, all right? 4,77 sine 45. So this is going to give us a negative uh, 4, comma. So we're going to obtain negative 4,291. So we're going to have our J there, okay? These are the imaginary, the part with a J. So consider that this here to be written in that algebraic format that you're given of this. Remember, it was easier to convert from this format to the, to the polar form. So also, if we have our answers in polar form, we can easily write the same way they were before. So we are supposed to have this in polar form. So guys, we're just going to use your calculator, uh, convert this uh, to polar form. Remember, this is in rectangular form. So you must convert to polar form. So on your calculator, just uh, convert shift to polar form. So it's just going to be like this. So you're going to have shift this time to polar form. Uh, so it must write a pole here to polar form. So you write this as it is on your simplification. This part as it is, guys, here. This is 7, uh, 7, 8, 
so we have got 7 comma 7 8 in this case uh let's say 7 comma 7 9 8 uh then we separate this with a negative so that's negative 4 comma 2 9 1 like this all right so this is going to give us r in uh in polar form uh, which is our uh, our uh resultant that we are having of 8 comma that will be 901 if you convert to three decimal place so that will be 8,901. Uh, the angle that we're going to have is already there, theta. There, the theta, negative 28,82. So it's going to be something like that, uh, negative 28,823 degrees. So this is our total current in amps. This is our total current that we just obtained there. But is it the format that we are given? No. So uh, we are supposed to convert to the total format that we are given, that we are given here. Because the format is we are given this as a, a, just like what we had 8,85 si sign. This is either you're going to write back to the radians or you convert to degrees. But these, as long as you're dealing with omega, these are radians that you are given. These are radians that you are given or, or, on that part. You are working with radians there. So if you want to, to work with the radians like that, it means you must convert this to radians. So meaning uh, we are going to have our total current as eight which is the 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 more just like guys the same way that we took here is remember this was the same number that you had eight comma eight five eight comma eight five so we're just reversing from this side going back to the same format that we had before so this is going to be eight comma nine zero one remember that was sine uh three one four two comma two three one four two three one four comma two times the time like I said, this is a part of the radian concept. So in, for you to maintain this, you must convert this to radians. So how do you convert to radians? Remember that pi is equivalent to what? Pi is equal to 180 degrees. So there we are given 28,823 degrees. So how many radians? So it's going to be 28,823 over 180 times pi. The answer that you're obtaining is in radians which is 0, 0,503 like this in radians so that is the radian part this also must be in radians if you choose to use the degrees that we are seeing here if you choose to maintain these degrees you are going to write this you are going to multiply this by um by 57,3 remember that conversion of 57,3 so your it was going to be uh, like this, 8,901. Then this will be sine, you multiply 314,2t times what? 57,3 uh, degrees. That is to show that we have converted this to a degree, constitute to a degree part. It is now considered as uh, in degrees, like the calculation there is now affected every, in degrees. So we can use our degrees, this one, as it was in degrees, the negative 28,823. If you multiply this by 57,3. So you must consider that part. This is a radian concept. So this must be in radians also. You must consider that part that you are given there. All right. So that was our total current from what we have or what we are given in this case from the concept uh, that we are given. So from this part, we are also to consider um, the readings on the ammeter connected in series with the parallel branch. So it's going to be the same current, but the reading on the ammeter, we can consider the RMS value when uh, this is the exact value that you consider, uh, but it's the same value. Remember, from a parallel connection, if you connect an ammeter here, the same current that was here, that was here, it was the same, that is branching. So this one and this one added, 
is that total current. So that total current that we are talking about is the one, but we need its RMS value, uh, the one that you can read on the meter. So this is 3.3 RMS value. We saw that this is 0 0.707 times the maximum value, and we have got uh, the maximum value of the current, uh, which is 8.901. So that was going to give us uh, 6 comma two nine three amps so that will be the current that will be read on them on the meter and uh, draw the vector diagram for the circuit so for this circuit there were so many currents guys i1 it is lagging by negative 60 i2 uh, is on top with 45 then the total current negative let's let's just see what we can do here because they are Current one, current two, uh, current one. All right, all right. Sorry for that, guys. Just hope it's gonna make sense. Let me just try and have it here. So we saw that we just gonna have something like this. Current one at um, negative sixty degrees. So meaning to say, you're gonna have our current one at uh, negative sixty. Let's just approximately negative sixty degrees. So that will be our I1 at negative uh, 60 degrees. Uh, then I2 was at what? 45 degrees. So I2 at uh, 45 degrees. Then the total current is at negative uh, 28, somewhere going down there. So it's just going to be 28, oh, sorry, here, 28, 823. It's in the negative side. So that will be for our total current there. So that's it, guys. Uh, with this, this is actually enough. This is enough for our presentation for three marks, guys. All right. So that was the vector diagram. Uh, then question four, we are to consider there we have got uh, part of a transformer. And we are given uh, that is uh, transformers are constructed by means of different types of elements. Name at least five principal elements, principal elements of transformers, uh, the major part that you're going to consider as the elements of a transformer. So remember, we're going to talk of the magnetic circuit. In this case, we need our magnetic circuit. Uh, we're also going to consider uh, the windings. Remember, on your transformer, uh, windings. Uh, we also talking of the cooling system. Uh, the cooling system. We also talk of the oil tanks. Oil tanks. Uh, the protection devices. We can also consider uh, the protection devices. All right. So just at least five from what we have there. Then four point two. We are given the magnetizing and core loss components. Of what? Of a no load current of a transformer are these and this respectively. So that's 4.2. This is simply from our no load uh, phase diagram uh, of a transformer. Uh, just gonna have something of this. So remember, uh, we will need our no load current. All right, taken in between these two currents which is uh, having the magnetizing component on this side and this side having our core component, which is IC, which is the same. The distance from this point is the same. So it is the same IC that we are going to see here. Then uh, the phase angle uh, at no load and using our parallel line concept, as you can see, we are creating a Z here. So it is the same uh, angle that we'll be having here. All right, so that is a 90 degree that you have there. So let's see what we have. We are given in this case uh, areas, the magnetizing and core loss components. So the core loss magnetizing, so the magnetizing, that is the first one, the magnetizing component, uh, which is 4,105. Then the core loss component, which is 1,1 amps. So these are the ones that you're given. And 4.21, calculate the following, the no load current, which is this no load current. So guys, the no load current, it is simply the current across here. We have got this core loss, the magnetizing, and this is the no load along this branch. 
there are two values here. This is a right angle triangle that we are seeing, guys. So you can use our Pythagoras theorem to calculate that. So meaning to say uh, the no load current is simply taken from our Pythagoras theorem. So it's the square root of the magnetizing component squared plus the colors component squared. So it's just going to be a substitution there. All right. So that is uh, 4,105 squared plus 1,1 1, 1 squared. So that is going to give us our no load uh, current, which was going to be 4,250 amps. Okay, to three decimal places or just 4,25. So there we can consider the Kichok, I mean the Pythagoras, I mean, can speak to your mathematics there. 4.22, the no load power factor. All right, we know that the power factor taken from the theta power factor is cos of that r uh, phi. All right, so that means 4.22. So just going to consider 4.22. So there we need the power factor. That is the no load. So that means we talk of cos phi at what? At no load, which is simply from our diagram here, cos, remember, from our soccer to our concept. This is a right angle triangle, so you can also use uh, those trigonometric ratios, cos adjacent of hypotenuse, according to this phi that you are given, adjacent, that is the adjacent side, is IC. So that is going to be IC over the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse does not change, which is IO. All right, that is the hypotenuse there. So meaning to say, we're just going to need to substitute IC. We have it, our colors component, 1,1, 1, 1, to the no load current, which we calculated of 4,25. So the end, I mean, the decimal that you're obtaining is your power factor in that case. So in this case, we were going to obtain uh, the power factor as uh, three decimal place. It was going to be 0, 0,259. So then we have got uh the power factor all right that's just like that then another part 4.23 the power on open circuit meaning to say at no load using the no load current given that the circuit or the transformer is supplied at 100 volts so we can calculate the power at no load that is that that's at what at what open circuit at open circuit so that's 4.23, which is power. Uh, we're going to consider the voltage times the no load current times the power factor, which is at no load. So everything there, we have the voltage taking at what? The voltage supplied is 1,000 volts. So that's 1,000 times that no load current that we calculated before. Remember, we have got our no load current here. That's 4.25 times our power factor, the cos of phi, which is 0, 0,259. All right, so there we are going to obtain the power, which was 1,100,75 watts. So this is the output power that we consider at, for open, on open circuit, that is at no load, because remember, this is open circuit, uh, of a transformer, the, 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 uh, the diagram that we are seeing here, the characteristics, at no load, open circuit, that's at no load. So you must consider your questions, just transformers, work with uh, different question papers so that you see how do they ask these questions because what we are going to have now is not the same as what we are going to have another paper. There's another part, but these er er all right, so question number five, it was uh, the part of AC machines where we are given 5.1. There is a three phase six pole. All right, let's just see what we are given here. Let's see what we are given. So we are given a three phase six pole induction motor. That's an induction motor there. Remember, you are working with a three phase. So six pole, that is the pair poles. We can obtain uh, the pair poles there. Six divided by two, that will be three pairs. 
then this induction motor rotates at this is the rotor speed the speed of the rotor the speed of the motor that is the speed of the rotor that you'll be having there 780 revs per minute while being supplied from the line voltage remember the three phase we consider this as our line voltage of 440 volts 50 hertz which is the frequency of uh, 50 hertz so that's what you're given so the question is calculate 5.11 the synchronous speed of the magnetic field so the synchronous speed uh, the synchronous speed guys it's a direct formula that you need the synchronous speed is simply the frequency over the pair poles. This formula is for calculating the synchronous speed in revs per second. Just consider your frequency as it is, which is 50, over the pair poles, which is 3. So you're going to have your NS as 16,667 revs per second. This will be in revs per second. If you want to have this in revs per minute, since this other speed is raised per minute and also other calculations. You never know what's going to happen. You might need also the raised per minute as this is in raised per minute. You can use that in revs per minute. The synchronous speed in revs per minute is going to be 60 F over, over P. You multiply by 60 to convert to raised per minute. So simply 60 times the frequency. Remember that is 50 over the pair poles, which is 3. So this was going to give us uh, 1,000, all right? We are going to obtain 1,000 revs per minute. So this is in revs per minute if you want to have it that way. All right, another part, it was to calculate the percentage slip at which the motor is operating. Also from your formula sheet, guys, we are given this uh, formula uh, under your AC machines. So check the formula. Uh, the formula is given as S is equal to NS minus NR over NS. We have this formula, but we need the percentage. So you're going to multiply by 100%. Already we calculated our NS, which is the synchronous speed. So it's going to depend. If you use the revs per second, you must convert this to revs per second. If you use the revs per minute, meaning to say you must maintain the revs per minute. So in this case, guys, I'm just going to maintain uh, the revs per minute. So it's going to be 1000 minus our rotor speed. Remember, that is 780 from the speed of the motor. That is 780 over NS, which is 1000 again times 100%. This was going to give us the percentage slip. That was going to be 0 0.22 times 100%, uh, percent, which was going to end up as uh, 22 percent so just like that so that will be at 22 percent so you have to consider same values same units revs per minute revs per minute revs per second revs per second also all right 5.2 we are given name three uses of a resistance stat uses where are we going to have this uh, uh resistance start induction run motor so remember this can be used in fans it can be used uh in blowers we can use this also in fridges we can also use this uh in tumble dryers There's a lot of things that we can use this in washing machines uh we can have this in washing machines we can also this in wood uh working tools we can also consider in wood working uh tools so many uses that can be given state how the speed of a universal motor can be controlled the speed of a universal motor can be controlled by including a variable resistor in a series with the motor so this is can be controlled by including a variable that is a variable resistor a variable resistor in series so it must be in series with uh the motor so it must be in a series with the motor all right so that was our question five question number six uh we are given a condition of uh in a hydroelectric power station water from large dam or reservoir is piped into the turbine situated underground the turbine converts kinetic energy of the falling water into mechanical energy which is supplied to 
to the alternator. Use Fig2 uh, below that shows how electricity is generated using uh, a pumped storage scheme. And we also have and answer the questions that for so from this diagram. All right, they're saying from this diagram, use this diagram to answer these questions. Name the five stages represented A to E, write only uh, the label next to the letter A to E. All right, so we're just going to write the label A to E. So what is A representing? So A, we have our dam. This is the dam that you are given. Uh, then this B represents the valve house. So it is the valve house. Uh, then we also have C. So C here is the sage tank. So there we are talking of the sage tank. Then D becomes, uh, that's our generator here. So remember, that's your generator. Then E is the turbine. So that was the question we're supposed to write. But you're supposed to write, uh, in your answer book, A is this, B is this, C is that like, okay? Uh, you're supposed to name that properly. All right, so that was five marks just for that. Then on number 6.2, we are given, can instrument transformers be used for measuring instruments in DC mesh? Can we use instrument transformers? No, uh, we cannot use this because they will not operate. So they will not operate then 6.3 we are given during a test to determine the value of an unknown resistor a voltmeter was connected across an unknown resistor the arrangement was connected in series with an ammeter the voltmeter there's a 10 volt the ammeter there's 0 0.5 and the voltmeter is a resistance take note the voltmeter is a resistance so meaning to say when we connected this voltmeter in parallel to the unknown resistor, the voltmeter is having its own resistance. We are going to consider as a normal parallel circuit because it has a resistance of 20 kilo ohms, 20,000 ohms, where the voltage across the voltmeter also we are given 10 volts. Remember, this is a parallel, so it means also it is the voltage across the resistor is 10 volts but this is an unknown resistor that we are given. So they are saying this combination of a voltmeter and this unknown resistor, this arrangement was connected in a series with an ammeter. So there is an ammeter which is measuring current, and this ammeter, the current that was measured across this ammeter was 0 0.5 amps, which is the current from this circuit, the current here flowing, Towards it's going to flow this way, or if you consider your diagram as a normal. All right, so that is uh, we're just going to consider uh, the voltage across here also uh, that is affecting. So, what is it that we are supposed to consider in this situation, guys? We do understand this current that we are seeing uh, from this branch is the same, right? We're going to consider. Current is the same flowing. So you're going to have that current also here, which is the current enter, which is not a matter of fact. But as we consider the current of 0, 0,5, we must know that it is supplying two currents the current across the voltmeter and also the current across this unknown resistor. So the question is what can we do? Can we have any of this? Because if we can have this current, we can have the resistance, since we do understand that from the resistance, uh, I mean, from the voltage and current, we can calculate resistance. So if we can just have this current, so from where? Let's consider what is happening on our circuit here so that we can have the current. There is a voltage and resistance here on the voltmeter. So we can calculate the current across the voltmeter from the voltage over resistance. There is a voltage of 10, the resistance across that is 20. So that was going to give us the current across the voltmeter, which is 0, 0.005 uh, amps. But using our Kirchhoff's law, we do understand that the supply of 0, 0.5 is the one feeding these two currents. So from these two currents, we can calculate the unknown current from the supply, which is the total current, minus 
the current across the voltmeter. So the total current in this case is the supply, which was read from the ammeter of 0 0.5. That of the voltmeter is the one that we calculated here, which is 0 0.005. Uh, 0 0.005. There are three zeros there. So we have to subtract 0 0.0005. That was going to give us the current that is flowing across the unknown resistor, which is 0 0.4995 amps. So having a current here flowing across this circuit of 0 0.4995, we can calculate the resistance, guys. We have the voltage. We have the current. So resistance can be calculated from this formula, voltage over current. The voltage in parallel, remember, in a parallel connection, the voltage is the same. So 10 over the current, which is 0 0.4995. That was going to give us uh, the resistance of this unknown result that we are given. And that was going to be 20,020 ohms, which is simply uh, 20,02 ohms. So that was it, guys, uh, from our a pure exams uh 2020 form uh considering our electrotechnics and for this uh our full paper having a total of 100 marks so let us consider as many question papers as much revisions and on the comment section let's talk about areas that need to be uh covered as we are preparing for the exams which are just ahead of time so make sure that you are on the right track revise for your exams prepare for your exams we do not have any uh time left few days left uh for these exams so let's revise as much as we can uh that is it till we meet again